I thus address the world through the medium of the latest wonderful invention so that my voice, like my great show, will reach future generations and be heard centuries after I have joined the great and, as I believe, happy majority. Welcome to Becoming Barnum, the journey to fame and fortune, a podcast presented by the Barnum Museum in Bridgeport, Connecticut. The Barnum Museum has a unique treasure in its collection, a 750-page copybook of letters written by Phineas Taylor Barnum when he was traveling in Europe in the 1840s, introducing his young protege, General Tom Thumb, to millions of ordinary people, as well as royalty and high society. These letters offer a unique glimpse into the life of P.T. Barnum as a husband, father, mentor, and entrepreneur. Join us as we travel back in time and learn about the real person behind the legendary P.T. Barnum through his own words. If you enjoy this episode, we would appreciate it if you would subscribe to our podcast to help our rankings and support the Barnum Museum. And now, on with the show a great country for wealth and grandeur. Last time, we left Barnum in a state of great anxiety as he tried to work out a settlement to compensate the people who'd been injured at the theater in Airdrie, Scotland. The unfortunate accident had heaped yet another worry on his plate. While profits had been good at the start of the Scottish tour in the eastern cities and towns, they had plummeted at the last few venues in Glasgow and the surrounding towns, and Barnum was increasingly concerned about the play for General Tom Thumb that he had commissioned from Albert Smith. He still did not have a print copy in hand, and the boy needed to learn his lines prior to his arrival in London. In addition, Barnum was in very low spirits, worrying about his wife, who was due to deliver their fourth child. Late February of 1846 found Barnum and the entourage heading south toward England, and by March 1st, Barnum had reached London while the general, Charles Stratton, and his people headed to Cambridge. Barnum expected they would join him in a week, as he had booked Charles at London's famed Egyptian Hall for morning, afternoon, and evening levies beginning March 9th. These would surely be popular and make up for their marginal profits in the Glasgow area. Barnum considered Mr. and Mrs. Thomas Brittell of London to be particularly close friends, and had taken the trouble to purchase handsome gifts for them while in Scotland. Brettel was a painter, but he also took care of other tasks for Barnum. In addition to printing handbills and booklets and preparing newspaper advertisements to promote General Tom Thumb, he dealt with Barnum's mail, providing him with a consistent address and forwarding mail to him while he was on tour. He also dealt with some financial tasks, such as ensuring that Mrs. Swift, wife of Englishman Professor Swift, whom Barnum employed at his museum in New York, received her husband's salary. So the brief letter Barnum wrote to Brittell from Paisley on February 21st bears a surprisingly curt tone. Barnum had already communicated with him on January 20th to say he was anxiously awaiting the proofs of the new play, but a month later he still did not have the proofs, at least not for the second act. His annoyance is palpable, as he bluntly remarked, It is really too bad that the general does not get the new play. It will be many pounds out of our pocket if he don't learn it before arriving in London. We are in Penrith 24th, Kendall 25th, and Rugby 26th. I shall call on you the 27th. Three days later, uncertain if that letter would resolve the issue, Barnum wrote to Albert R. Smith, the writer whom he had commissioned to rewrite Le Petit Pousse. My dear Smith, we have never yet received a line of the second act from Mr. Brittell. I shall be in town within the next seven days, and will call on you with the l'argent, French for money. I shall probably arrive on Friday of this week. Adding a note of humor in a postscript, he teased, General says he is a thousand bricks, and begs you to remember it. By Thursday evening, February 26th, Barnum had received the play from Brittell and wrote to thank him. He also included the text for a newspaper advertisement with instructions that the many words with triple underlines should be typeset in uppercase letters. Barnum made three tries at composing his ad. Presumably the last was the one sent, despite its numerous cross-outs and insertions. As usual, the ad emphasized that the general would be returning to America shortly, but goes further by saying that he would then relinquish his public exhibitions. 
His size being 25 inches and weight 15 pounds, he was claimed to be smaller than any infant that ever walked alone, and one-third the weight of any dwarf ever seen in England. Much of the ad space lists the various royals whom he had appeared before, and the number of times, followed by the assertion that more than two million persons had seen General Tom Thumb in the last two years. His extraordinary performances and new costumes, as well as the magnificent presents given by Her Majesty, could be seen at his levees, held from 11 to 1, 3 to 5, and 7 to 9 o'clock each day, with admission at one shilling, and children under 10 half price. At the end, Barnum squiggled a pointing hand to indicate that a manicule, also known as a printer's fist, should be inserted, followed by the announcement that the general's miniature equipage will promenade the streets daily. Barnum told Brittell he would be in London on Friday, and despite the short notice, would like him to have 20 slips ready. I shall call about one or two o'clock. Barnum also wrote to his friend Mr. Collins in London asking if he might stay at the Collins' home until he could find a suitable apartment near Egyptian Hall. He did not wish to inconvenience them in any way, especially not Mrs. Collins, noting that it would be no trouble to put the portmanteau he'd left there in a cab and find a hotel, he would happily do so if your lady should think that my staying would be causing her any annoyance or trouble. Doubtless she would be pleased to see Barnum, who had been trying to find employment for her son, recently arrived in America and trained as a saddle maker. Barnum's letter to Collins also made a brief reference to the accident in Airdrie, suggesting Collins already knew of it, perhaps from a newspaper. Barnum commented only that, We have hardly got over our fight yet from the breaking down of the floor at Airdrie. The next letter is a long one written to Fortis Hitchcock on March 1st. But rather than reporting on the United Kingdom tour, Barnum had a lot to say about his business concerns stateside, so we will pick that up next time. However, the letter also expresses Barnum's deep personal fear regarding his wife, Charity. And as it turned out, he was writing this on the very day that their daughter, Pauline, was born. So we should certainly give some attention to this important letter. Family is truly the most noble purpose that money can be devoted to. Money thus extended is well laid out. To Hitchcock's emphatic ear, he wrote, Yes, I long since heard of the death of my wife's sister. And that fact, added to the numbers of other cases of death from childbirth this year, is what makes me more than usually uneasy regarding the safety of my wife. Oh, my dear friend, you cannot conceive, and yet you surely can, the terrible doubts and fears that suspense gives a man who is far from his home, as I am at the time of my wife's confinement. I cannot bear to think of it. Barnum then turned to answering a letter from family friend Mrs. Henry Barnum, Apparently, her husband was not a close relative of P.T. Barnum. He was grateful to her for writing to him from Bridgeport, sharing news of his wife and daughter Helen, since Charity herself did not often write to him. His letter to My Good Friend Mrs. B. was also penned on Pauline's birth date, though he would not know of her safe arrival for some time. He wrote with glowing words to thank Mrs. B. for corresponding, and added, I am glad to hear that you call on Charity. That sounds more sociable, and I prefer to hear it from the lips of friends. And I trust in God that ere you receive this, she will be safe and comfortable. If she is spared this time, no earthly inducement would ever tempt me to be away from her again under similar circumstances. It is shameful and cruel of me, and I am daily getting severely punished for it, for the thought of the subject almost drives me mad. Barnum changed the subject to food to distract himself and pretend to be annoyed with Mrs. B for mentioning his favorite dish. He chided her, Oh, you can't think how you hurt my feelings in your last letter. You made me almost rave with impatience mingled with despair. Would you know the subject which gave me all this grief and suffering? It is comprised in two syllables, oysters. I am sure it was well meant in you, but believe me, it was the unkindest cut of all, as Shakespeare says. Or, as he does not say, I have forgotten which. Barnum continued at length to describe the misery of being taunted with the thought of oysters, and assured her he could not wait to set foot in old America once more to enjoy the oysters again. His commentary on English food is far from positive, starting with the remark that if Charity had given her a touch of English plum pudding, and the taste was not to her liking, it would at least give her an exalted notion of our own Yankee puddings. For truth to say, the cookery in England is miserable compared to that of America. He elaborated, 
I would rather have one dish of Yankee chicken pot pie than all the dishes ever cooked in this kingdom. Here they don't know what a pot pie is. The fools don't even know what cold slaw is. And I would as soon think of eating brick bats and paving stones as of cutting raw cabbage into vinegar and eating it. In regard to cookery, the English are two centuries behind the age, and at least one in regard to dress. Barnum also shared with Mrs. B the story of the accident in Airdrie, and even enclosed a news clipping. As he reported the incident to her, hundreds fell through the collapsed floor, but only 41 were injured, a few of them suffering broken bones. It was a great miracle that none were killed, and a greater one that we all escaped unhurt, and especially the general. However, I herewith enclose you an account of it, and beg you will hand it to friend Pomeroy for publication, with my best compliments. As always, Barnum saw an opportunity for promotion, even with the mixed news that people had been injured, though Tom Thumb had escaped unhurt. Concluding his letter to Mrs. B, Barnum told her that in a week's time they would open in London, where they expected to remain for two months. He explained, It is now the height of the London season. The town is full of nobbies with their splendid equipages, and I guess I would like to go a sightseeing with you here for about a fortnight. You would be a little astonished, and no mistake. This is a great country for wealth and grandeur but ours is the country for simplicity of government and the real happiness of the people. God bless America, and God bless you all. We hope you're enjoying the episode. If you want to support us, consider subscribing to our podcast and leaving us a review. It really helps us out. Now, let's dive into the next segment, The Lion, the Mummy, and the Museum. Upon Barnum's return to London from Scotland, he found an unusually long letter awaiting him from his American museum manager and sat down to reply immediately. Barnum's response comprised the usual eight pages to Fortis Hitchcock, and while we don't know the number of pages in Hitchcock's letter of January 7, 1846, Barnum could not resist pointing out that its length was as good as telling him their winter business was sluggish. On Barnum's end, there was no shortage of news, advice, opinions, and personal reflections to share with Hitchcock in his letter of March 1st. Some of the latter have already been included in recent episodes. However, there is so much more to extract from this letter. The bulk of it concerns novelties and attractions, and some issues with employees, plus a variety of business dealings, even an investment in half a lion. Yes, a lion. Oh, and Barnum was also debating whether to purchase a guano-mummified man. Have we said these letters are never dull? Hitchcock's spare time would soon vanish as the novelties from Europe began arriving and required setup and promotion, and as he learned what he would have to prepare for the next batch being shipped. Since there are quite a few new things to talk about in this letter, we will hold back on updates to attractions previously discussed and address them in future episodes. First, we'll see what's up with Barnum's business affairs, and then explore a few of the new topics. Barnum was already feeling frustrated with his uncle Allenson Taylor, who was now his partner in the operation of the Baltimore Museum. Much as he loved his uncle, Barnum was keenly aware of the man's shortcomings and past failures of judgment. But perhaps most upsetting was the discovery that Taylor had not used the money Barnum had loaned him months earlier in the way he had said he would, to become a partner in a cloth business in New York City. Not trusting his uncle's investment savvy in the world of show business, Barnum had thought the cloth business was a safe bet to ensure Taylor's financial stability. As it turned out, his uncle had decided to simply take $500 of the loaned money for his own use. Barnum was perturbed and relayed his feelings on the matter to Hitchcock. I never before knew that Taylor did not invest the $5,000 with Wheeler's, and he had better have thrown the hole into the sea than to have thus appropriated $500 to himself, while he was telling me that the whole of it was to be invested in the cloth business. Straws tell which way the wind blows, and one dishonest act will open the eyes of a man of the world to watch for others from the same source. Thus alerted to the need for additional caution in the new partnership with his uncle, Barnum advised Hitchcock, Do your business with him friendly, but firmly and strictly. Offering more specific instructions, he noted, Try to keep your account with Taylor plain and distinct, so that I can settle correctly with him on my return. 
see that an eye is kept on the interest, which he must allow me for all money which he has of mine. Of course, I am to pay one half the cost of Baltimore Museum, and he allows me interest on all money which I pay for the other half, as well as all money which he has heretofore had really or pretendly to invest with the Wheelers. As a further precaution, he added, I hope Taylor will send you the title and insurance policy of the Baltimore Museum. I do consider it very important that you have the papers. It would be unbusinesslike, if not unsafe, to leave them in Taylor's hands. The matter of hiring employees for the Baltimore Museum enterprise also raised Barnum's ire, and he expressed no little disgust that his uncle had gone and hired a man at the rate of $50 per week. He commented, It was very wrong and stupid in Mr. Taylor to give that Nelson $50 per week. I could hire the same thing here for $10 and would not give it. In a postscript, Barnum suggested the possibility of hiring the son of Mr. and Mrs. Collins, who had been sent over from England by his parents and needed employment. Finding work as a saddle maker seems not to have panned out, at least as far as Barnum knew at that point, and he assumed the young man was trustworthy and could be instructed in managing tickets and keeping accounts. If he could get him set up at the Baltimore Museum, he, Barnum, would gain a little more knowledge of what his uncle was up to. He explained the idea to Hitchcock thusly. If that youngster has not got work yet, and you cannot well give him a chance in the museum, I think you had better write to Taylor that I wish him to take the tickets, and see to the account of receipts and expenses of Baltimore Museum. Let him give him three dollars per week and his board and washing to commence on, and after Taylor agrees to this arrangement, let the chap go on, and before going, instruct him that I wish him to keep a close eye on his business, to know and take every ticket that passes the door, etc. On the positive side, Barnum was very pleased with the way Hitchcock had managed the transaction with Rembrandt Peel, seller of the Baltimore Museum collection, as well as his cleverness in dealing with Old Seaman, who was selling the New York Peel's museum collection. Though Barnum does not offer sufficient clues for us to understand that negotiation triumph, his response to Hitchcock raises an eyebrow. That gas-fixture dodge with Old Seaman was capital and reflects great credit on your perception and tact. It was a glorious joke, though a sorry one for Seaman. Barnum retained a keen sense of competition with his entertainment rivals, despite being abroad for two years. He had newspapers sent to him, and as we know, he kept up with many correspondents. So when he learned that someone else was making a first-to-show claim, which he felt rightfully belonged to the American Museum, he was anxious to jump in the ring and challenge it. Not that he minded having an excuse to make a noise, as he put it, because controversy of most any sort was a good thing in his business. He told Hitchcock, I observe in the Atlas newspaper that at somebody's concert, I think King's, at Niblos, or the Apollo, the harmonium was announced as a new and splendid instrument, etc. Now, if that is not our harmonium, you should come out in the newspapers and bills and make a devil of a noise about it. Tell the public that the American Museum was the first to introduce it in America, that it is played every day, etc., and thus work up a big excitement on the subject. The people would wonder what all this noise was about and would go and see. Such excitements pay, depend on it. Barnum was no doubt thinking back to the Fiji mermaid stir in 1842, a controversy he himself engineered. He was also pleased to hear that another strategy he and Hitchcock had implemented to attract visitors was proving successful, offering daily afternoon performances, not just on Sundays. Barnum understood that his audience had options in choosing their amusements, as they were called back then, as entertainment venues and New York City tourism was coming into its own. Just as today's Big Apple tourists often plan a marathon schedule of shows and activities, Barnum realized that some of his museum visitors would welcome the opportunity to attend performances both in the daytime and evening. For many reasons, offering afternoon performances would prove to be a win-win for the American Museum, for example, by also attracting more women and families to visit. I am sure you are right about afternoon performances. They more than pay in the long run, and every year would pay better and better for when the public get to know that they can see the exhibitions every day in the daytime. Many will do that in order to go elsewhere at night and thus give us more room for others at night. I believe in day performances the year round, and I'm sure you will find it pays well on the long run. 
The story of Barnum's unprecedented success in bringing Jenny Lind, the Swedish nightingale, to America in 1850 is well known. His promotion of both her angelic voice and generous spirit caught the public's imagination and sparked Lind mania during her North American concert tour, and she remained a beloved superstar for decades after. Though Barnum had taken an enormous risk, both he and she were more than amply rewarded. That being the case, it was interesting to find in Barnum's letter of 1846 an idea that foretells his crafting of the Jenny Lind tour a few years later. As he explained to Hitchcock, There is a Miss Reynolds here who has been five years in America as a singer, and she performs some. She says you sent to propose an engagement with her once. She is the same girl that went from England with Yankee Hill. She has played and sang at the Chatham. She made some money in America, owns a house in Mercer Street, New York, in which her mother now lives. She will soon be singing at the Haymarket here in London, and will return to America in about a year. Would she be attractive? And if yes, what could I afford to give her for six months or a year to sing in both museums and give concerts elsewhere in connection with somebody else? Inquire into her merits and let me know. Dr. Oatman knows her, and I suspect in more than one way, but perhaps not. Miss Reynolds was, in her time, quite popular. As Barnum said, she had performed at the Chatham. A benefit performance there is announced in the June 27, 1844 issue of the New York Herald, and it seems that was her regular venue. But only six months later, the Herald noted that she was late of the Chatham Theater, having been compelled to withdraw from the profession. The cause was continued severe indisposition. She did in fact recover and perform again, although the Herald remarked that she had been reported dead several times, but had returned to England. Her performances at the Haymarket are mentioned in the Foreign Theatricals column of the Herald in 1847 and 1849. Whether she was ever persuaded to return to America is not clear, though of course Barnum came to realize that Jenny Lind was the one to pursue. In 1849, the English were crazy to see and hear Jenny, and he was certainly aware of her immense popularity with the public there. Turning to a very different kind of attraction, Barnum was thinking he might replicate the success, which had surprised him, but not Hitchcock, of the petrified body displayed at the American Museum, human remains that had been found in a cave in Tennessee. Referring again to its profitability in his March 1st letter, he asked Hitchcock for his thoughts on the purchase of an unusual petrified or mummified man he had recently seen. The body, he wrote, was dug from the guano bed at Ikebo Island off the coast of Namibia. There is no mistake about it, and the fellow has the first scientific patronage in England. He has asked the British Museum for 500 pounds, but has offered it to me for 300 pounds. I may possibly be induced to give him 200 pounds, $1,000, but guess not. It is indeed most curious. The flesh has become absorbed. The skin, muscle, and bone are preserved. The muscles are a little soft, but the whole body is perfect, and on the whole, not of an unpleasant appearance. No more so than a mummy, nor in fact so much so. What think you about it? It is possible that the remains Barnum saw were that of a man named Christopher Delano, whose identified body was found on the guano-covered island and brought to Liverpool, England by a Captain Weathers. Guano is bird or bat excrement, and as it accumulates on the rocky surfaces where these creatures live and nest, it hardens and becomes an excellent fertilizer, rich in nitrogen and phosphates. Mining guano from sea islands and caves became highly profitable in the 19th century, akin to a gold rush, and the global trade in this valuable commodity escalated to become a fiercely competitive market. In the early 1840s, a company in Liverpool gained the rights to remove guano from Ichabo Island, which was a fine rocky habitat for certain seabird species, but completely inhospitable for human life. Since the island had accumulated a depth of about 23 feet of guano, this was an immensely valuable, though tiny, island of 16 acres. According to Krista Kilgrove, author of the January 9, 2017 article for MentalFloss.com, How the Global Bird Poop Trade Created a Traveling Mummy Craze, perfectly preserved bodies, including animal remains, were sometimes found buried in the guano on these ocean islands around the world. Curiously, Barnum wrote that the muscles were a little soft, but other descriptions of the period suggest the guano-preserved bodies seemed petrified, likening them in appearance to stone. 
Whether Barnum saw the remains of Delano or some other unfortunate person who died on Ichabo Island is unknown. We may yet find out in letters ahead. Delano's body went to the British Museum and then toured the United Kingdom, so if we learn that Barnum did purchase the remains he had been offered, they were probably not Christopher Delano's. About the lion. Long before Barnum's well-known circus enterprises, he was involved in traveling menageries. As you may recall from our episode A Jolly Lot of Brother Showman, episode 19, his network included a number of the circus and menagerie pioneers of his day, and he had had opportunities to socialize with them while in London. In the March 1st letter to Hitchcock, Barnum inquired about the status of various investments, ending with the amusing comment that Bell ought to sell his half of that lion at the same price I paid Titus for the other half. This conjures up the humorous notion that one half of a lion could become more or less valuable than the other half. Louis Titus was among the first circus men to show under a tent in upstate New York, not far from Barnum's hometown. Titus and three other men had formed a company to acquire exotic wild animals, both for their own shows and to sell to others. Barnum's question to Hitchcock suggests he had loaned Titus money to purchase a lion, but the transaction might only have been recorded as a scribbled note, little better than a gentleman's handshake. He asked, Has Titus paid that note? If not, you had better let him give in exchange another note properly drawn. For if I recollect right, it was not properly drawn. Barnum had learned some hard lessons on that score, and would continue to do so in the years ahead. But just as this letter abundantly reveals, he always kept his eyes on the prize. Thank you for listening to this episode of Becoming Barnum, The Journey to Fame and Fortune. Support for this episode is provided by the City of Bridgeport American Rescue Plan Act Funds, Peoples United, a division of M&T Bank, and the Connecticut Humanities and National Endowment for the Humanities. The podcast was produced by the Barnum Museum and based on the blog series Barnum's Letters from Abroad by Adrian St. Pierre. Editing and sound design are by Rui Pino, and narration is by William Saris. Kathleen Marr is our executive director, and John Swing is our COO. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the podcast and visit our YouTube channel for behind-the-scenes presentations of our collections and more stories about the legendary showman. Connect with us on social media and let us know what you think. Please tune in next time as we continue our adventures with P.T. Barnum.